As you all know, Foreign Minister José Manuel Álvarez was due to be here today, but unfortunately, um, as you all know, we are living through exciting political, uh, an exciting political period. Uh, democracy is messy, as many of you have been telling us throughout this meeting. He very much wanted to be here, and he wants me, he has asked us to apologize on his behalf, but he has very kindly recorded a message, uh, which we will now listen to. Thank you. Queridos amigos, es un placer recibiros aquí en el Ministerio de Asuntos Exteriores, en nuestra casa. La red TEPSA es la más relevante en cuanto a la investigación en asuntos europeos. Es un orgullo ser anfitrión de esta reunión. Sois los máximos conocedores del proceso de integración europea en vuestros países y lamento profundamente no poder estar entre vosotros personalmente. Desde que comenzamos a preparar la presidencia del Consejo de la Unión, hemos tenido muy claro que debía de ser un proceso integrador. A nivel europeo, con una interlocución constante con las instituciones europeas, los miembros del trío y el resto de los Estados miembros. A nivel nacional, hemos colaborado con las Cortes Generales, con la sociedad civil a través del Foro de la Sociedad Civil y con un grupo de reflexión con expertos en asuntos europeos, porque estamos interesados en vuestras aportaciones. España toma el testigo de la Presidencia en un momento especialmente sensible. Tras la Unión, Lidia, con los efectos humanitarios, geopolíticos, económicos, energéticos de la agresión rusa a Ucrania. Desde España hemos defendido un plan de recuperación europeo centrado en el bienestar de los ciudadanos. Hemos abogado por la compra conjunta de vacunas. Hemos propuesto una reforma del mercado energético cuando nadie lo hacía. Y hemos impulsado la máxima solidaridad y compromiso con Ucrania. Frente al mayor cambio geopolítico desde la caída del muro de Berlín, España defenderá en Europa la unidad en el compromiso con Ucrania. Un compromiso que será una prioridad transversal durante la presidencia. Porque el coste de la inacción nos llevaría a una sociedad internacional guiada por la ley del más fuerte y porque nuestros valores están en juego. Todo esto es parte de la forma española de hacer Europa. Nuestra presidencia aspira a llevar a buen puerto un gran número de los expedientes legislativos abiertos. Son expedientes de total importancia para los europeos. La profundización de la Europa de la salud, la reforma del mercado eléctrico, la revisión de las normas de gobernanza fiscal para consolidar una política económica justa para todos. Queremos una Europa preparada para los grandes cambios, empezando por una digitalización responsable y un mayor despliegue de las energías renovables apostando por aumentar la soberanía energética europea. Es la Europa que queremos para todos los europeos, inclusiva, dando respuestas a desafíos estructurales como la despoblación, el envejecimiento, los derechos de las personas con discapacidad, las dificultades de los jóvenes. La unidad será también un principio rector de toda nuestra acción durante la presidencia. Unidad frente a la guerra y a sus consecuencias, para defender el modelo europeo, para trabajar con nuestros socios y aliados, unidos por la creencia en una sociedad abierta al mundo y no replegada sobre sí misma. Ya conocéis muchos de los hitos de la presidencia española. Yo destacaría dos. La cumbre Unión Europea CELAC, que celebramos en julio, la primera desde 2015, y el Consejo de octubre en Granada, con el fin de dotar de más contenido a la seguridad estratégica junto a la cumbre de la Comunidad Política Europea. Si queremos que la Unión Europea sea capaz de afrontar los desafíos del futuro, tenemos también que reflexionar sobre las reformas necesarias para llevar la integración un paso más allá. Una de ellas, la extensión del uso de la mayoría cualificada, tanto en la política exterior y de seguridad común como en otras políticas como la fiscal, sin olvidar el impulso a la adhesión de los países candidatos trasladando perspectivas realistas y claras con conformidad con la nueva metodología de ampliación y de acuerdo con los criterios de Copenhague. En este sentido, en el informe anual de progreso, daremos la bienvenida por primera vez a Ucrania, Moldavia y a Bosnia y Herzegovina. Durante las siete décadas de su existencia, el proyecto europeo ha conseguido no solo adaptarse y reinventarse, sino convertirse en una comunidad cada vez más estrecha. Hoy, Toca volver a modernizar el proyecto europeo. 
Una Europa de futuro es una Europa que no sea víctima de los acontecimientos, sino un actor consciente y eficaz, capaz de adaptarse al futuro, también de moldearlo. Podéis contar con el apoyo de la presidencia española con ese objetivo. Muchas gracias, ministro. So as you've seen and as we've discussed throughout the last day and a half, um, Spain's fifth presidency of the Council of the European Union is going to be, I think, extremely rich and ambitious in outcomes. I know that some of you have expressed concern, uh, given the um, political situation that I very briefly mentioned in my slightly humorous uh, introductory remark. But let me reassure you, I'm a historian of European integration and I am absolutely convinced that this fifth Spanish presidency of the Council will be as successful as all the others were, starting back in 1989. That was another European Union, it was another uh, geopolitical context as well. Um, I also want to take this final opportunity to thank the team at El Cano, uh, Ignacio, Raquel, Manen, Maria Luisa, Ana, Ivan Oscar and all the others, I'm sure I'm forgetting names as I always do, for their extremely hard, uh, extremely uh, p good performance, very hard work in the last couple of months um, putting all of this together. And I'm, I hope you have all been uh, comfortable in Madrid. I also, of course, want to thank the foreign ministry represented here by Maria. You heard her yesterday. We are in very safe hands um, every time I see her confident. Uh, happy face, I always think the Spanish presidency is going to be a joy. Um, so thank you, Maria, for hosting us. And I also want to thank, thank um, Karma, who will be addressing you in a minute. Karma Colomina represents CIDOB, uh, which I always like to describe as our sister institution in Barcelona. In fact, CIDOB is the, one of the oldest think tanks in Spain. It was founded in 1973. And um, it's always a pleasure, Karma, to you. organize things with you. And I will then ask Paul Schmidt, on behalf of TEPSA, to say a few um, concluding remarks on behalf of the organization. So without further ado, and since we're running a little bit short of time, Karma, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. I will be brief, but I, I would try to be a little upon a little bit what we've heard these this two days, which has been so interesting, so enlightening, and, well, so challenging if we take into account all the challenge and, and, and uh, what we have ahead. And, and this feeling that the prospects of the European Union and also the prospects of the, the Spanish presidency will be um, decide a little bit for what's happening beyond EU's border, but also about our EU's ability to, to deal with that. So the first, the first thing, I think, uh, it's the, the presence of Ukraine in, in every mm -hmm. decision, in every discussion we had uh, during these two days. What will happen in Ukraine? What the prospect is? What are the different scenarios? Uh, will be decisive for where is the EU heading and what can happen for the, for the Spanish presidency. And it has a lot to do also with this strong comeback of, of the momentum for the enlargement. But as we really could hear yesterday, it's a strong momentum, but we don't know how it's going to happen, how we can make it possible. It's not only about them, it's a lot about us. It's about budget, of course, but it's also about how we reform the, the EU. Frank said yesterday, if you need unanimity to reform unanimity, you will never get it. So I think we start to, to think on the European Union. It's also about, about allies. It will be this uh, summit eu select which will be so important. It's not only about Latin America. It's the realization of the need of strong and diversified allies. So Latin America is an opportunity for a mutual interest uh, relation, but also this comeback also of regionalism, uh, the acceleration of other powers. How are we going to deal with India? How are we going to deal with in the Pacific? This is also something that we have to address uh, urgently in the European Union. It has a lot to do also with this concept of open strategic autonomy that it seems to me that it's more like a moving target because it's still 
uh, being defined at every step that, that we take uh, on the road. So it's how are we going to, to exercise power, but not only defense power, economical power. This is the real uh, EU power. So how are we going to deal with that? How are we going to be more autonomous when we are building new dependencies, clearly with China on digital and, and green transformation? And then how are we going to explain all that to the citizens? Richard was talking already yesterday about the need of narrative. How are we going to frame all these changes? And how are we going to do that not to answer to to vulnerabilities uh, or to explain that we have fear to the citizens, but in a positive way, in a way that it's uh, to explain that we are strengthening the European Union, because as the Reclaim Group, and that will be my, all, my last quote, also uh, mentioned yesterday, and I, I found it so, so interesting, it's not about this battle of narratives, it's to understanding why certain narratives can really root so easily. So it's, no, it's a lot to know about us and not only about what we want to say. And I will stop here, just thanking thank you, you very much, again. Carmen. Thank you. And thank you all for, for all the thoughts you, you share with us. If I can just add something very briefly um, to what Karma has very aptly um, underscored. Listening to the conversation we've had during the last day or so, um, what I take away from this is that the EU is really actually in a very difficult place, and perhaps we don't emphasize this sufficiently. We are not a military power. Um, I'm not sure that we are a civilian power, as Johann Galtung used to describe us. I'm not even sure that we're still a normative power, as Ian Manners wanted us to be. And we're obviously not terribly good at speaking the language of power or um, acquiring a geostrategic consciousness. Our answer, of course, to all of these challenges, the challenges we face in our relations with the United States, and what I would stress here is that our interests are similar but not identical, the challenges we face in dealing with China, how do we de-risk without decoupling, and the challenges we face in our relationship with what we nowadays call the Global South, and as I've made this point already so I won't repeat myself, but uh, this is a terrible term, which I think we should stop using. Um, let's call them emerging economies or the New South, because this is a very heterogeneous group of nations. It includes India, it includes South Africa, Brazil, um, and they themselves don't necessarily want to be labeled in this way. So my point is that the EU is actually not terribly well equipped to deal with this incre increasingly, ironically, old-fashioned world. Remember Robert Cooper, who used to say, that there are three types of international actors, pre-modern, modern, and post-modern. And we are a post-modern, post-national actor, post-colonial actor as well, by the way, despite what some people seem to believe. And yet, we are surrounded by modern, and perhaps in some cases, pre-modern actors. And this makes the EU's existence and its role as a cogent global actor extremely difficult. As Karma was saying, our answer to this is basically um, strategic autonomy, both in the defense and security realm, and also open strategic autonomy, um, a concept which is much broader and which includes industrialization, digitalization, and of course our response to some of the problems we discovered we had as a result of the pandemic. I have a rather cynical friend, it's always good to have cynical friends, I recommend it, who often says that whenever he hears uh, people talking about open strategic autonomy, He's reminded of the famous anecdote uh, when Mahatma Gandhi went to London. A rather irritating English journalist said, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think about Western civilization? And the Mahatma turned around, smiled, and gently said, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> and this is sometimes what I feel about open strategic autonomy. I think it would be a wonderful idea, but it's still very much a work in, pro in progress. Paul, over to you. Well, thank you, Charles. I'm happy to speak on behalf of TEPSA. And I would like to start by saying that, yes, I agree with you. It's very complex and it's a very difficult but interesting situation. And it's probably, as Alexander told us yesterday, it's probably a historical moment um, where we are. Um, and I would very much personally, uh, 
like our friends, uh, our Spanish friends, over the, sex, six, the next six months to talk about our strengths. And as the minister said, about our unity and the things that we can actually achieve together. Because I think sometimes uh, we are much better than we think we are. We always stress our weaknesses and our weak points and weak spots. And we do not talk enough about what we actually achieve. I think we are much better than, than many of us sometimes appear to be, to be saying. Now, I would like to stress very briefly five takes, takeaways, uh, takeaways from the last uh, one and a half days. Um, the first one would be uh, on enlargement. <coughs> I think it was a very prominent and important issue here. Mm -hmm. And um, Charles, I also have a cynical friend. <laughs> and this guy on enlargement, he told me that it will be impossible, impossible to integrate all those countries who want to join the European Union. But then he adds, it will be even more impossible not to integrate them. And so the question is, how can we actually move forward? You have said that there is a momentum now uh, with the war in Ukraine of speeding up and making the enlargement process more efficient. And I think the minister also stressed the importance of this enlargement process. And I think we should use this momentum with all the problems which we see, if you look back historically, uh, the enlargement process is a process of success. And I think that should be stressed more often. Second point on uh, the EU Council presidency. Um, now, we have heard that Spain is very, very well prepared. Maria has said that mm -hmm. you've been preparing for the last 24 months. It's great to hear, um, and we also know um, that um, sometimes things happen that you cannot prepare for. So prepare for the unforeseen, so to speak. No? Uh, Alexander um, emphasized that yesterday when he said uh, the presidency tries to set the agenda, but then actually in the end it's the agenda that sets the presidency. So you, you have to be very flexible, but I understand, and from my humble experience, uh, you have a very, very good and high, high quality um, civil service here and um, a set of think tanks uh, which can, can be uh, of a lot of help. So good luck with that and I keep the fingers crossed and whenever, wherever we can help, uh, we're ready to, to step in, of course. My third ta takeaway is on uh, climate change and the fight against climate change. Now we have the European Green Deal we have 15 binding regulation, regulations. There was a unanimous decision on these regulations, and now we have to implement them. We need political courage and political will. Time is of the essence. Uh, and we need to make this transformation affordable and socially just, if we want to see it happen and make it a reality. So, it seems to be that we are in a period where sometimes national political actors seem to forget about what they signed up to on European level. And we should be there to remind them. Fourth takeaway is on the role of think tanks and policy institute. And that is why I would say that these pre-presidency conferences, which TAPSO organizes, are so important. Because we have so many ideas and so many analyses out there, but we would like the political actors to listen to those ideas and to actually make them a political reality, wherever that is possible, implement them. Um, and we've seen many, many good ideas and warnings of experts uh, when it came to how to handle and treat the uh, corona pandemia, how to tackle climate change, how to um, reach uh, realistic um, approaches to tackling the migration issue, or how to, um, how to be careful when it comes to, uh, to our EU-Russian relations. So my plea is we have to listen Please listen to us. That's, that will be my, my, my fourth takeaway. 
And my fifth and last one is, is on, on the objectives. We've heard a lot about uh, the uh, minister also stressed um, many of the objectives uh, that uh, Spain as president, president of the EU Council is going to have. And they are, of course, um, well known. Um, uh, first and foremost, the Russian invasion against Ukraine. And I think, um, I think the minister has mentioned unity maybe five to seven times in his video. And I think that's the big issue. Alexander has said that unity will be, will, will be crumbling. It will be more and more difficult to maintain the cohesion. So that is actually the main task. The further we go with sanctions, the, 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 the further the deterioration uh, of, of our economies, the more important it is uh, to try and maintain this unity, which doesn't, mean, which doesn't mean neglecting our diversity, no. I mean, we have different opinions and different starting points, and we, uh, we discuss things, but this unity is important. Now, and then we have the um, proposals by the European Commission from September 2020 on asylum and migration. That would also be um, a great thing to see progress there already before the next uh, uh, electoral dates. Uh, from my perspective, also inflation, uh, tackling inflation uh, will be key. And also from my uh, perspective, having in mind the country which I know best, uh, the, an agreement on Mercosur would be, would be desirable. And I'm talking in a personal capacity, of course, I'm not an official uh, representative here. Now, um, and I would finish with this, please uh, keep an eye on unity uh, with a special focus on the upcoming European elections. I know you have national elections, but afterwards, next year, European elections. I think they will be dis decisive, and uh, that is what I wanted to tell you. Good luck. Thank you very much, Paul. And, thank and you let very me much. also, sorry, let me also, uh, at, in the end, I forgot, but I won't forget, thank the Elcano Institute very, very much for organizing this wonderful uh, event uh, on behalf of TEPSA, but also in particular CDOP. Uh, and th thank you to the hospitality of the ministry for having us here. And we would like to come back as soon as possible. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Gadma and Paul. I'm afraid all good things must come to an end, so it's my sad duty to bring these proceedings to a close. Thank you very much for your presence here today and for your support for all of our work. Thank you. Thank you.